Hey everybody, um, continuing with um, Charles Dickens' famous book, A Tale of Two Cities. Um, I'm not the type of person I'll start something and not finish it. So considering I've already started this book, I'm going to finish it. I'm not saying I'm enjoying it. Obviously I prefer American writers because I'm, I'm American. I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, and uh, so, but I will finish this book because this book has comes up so often. It was on Jeopardy just again yesterday. Um, so I'm going to finish this book and uh, this will be chapter three of A Tale of Two Cities. Right now I'm reading you uh, from Hawaii. If you hear the wind in the background, uh, that's because um, I'm actually in Waikiki, Hawaii. And Hurricane Lane is about to make landfall here in the next uh, 24 hours. Um, so with that being said, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and click the thumbs up button. And uh, we'll go ahead and continue with uh, Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, Chapter 3, The Night Shadows. A wonderful fact to reflect upon that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. A solemn consideration when I enter a great city by night that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret, that every room and every one of them encloses its own secret, that every beating heart and the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is, in some of its imaginings, a secret to the heart nearest to it. Something of the awfulness, even of death itself, is referable to this. No more can I turn the leaves of this dear book that I loved in vanity and vainly hope in time to read it all. No more can I look into the depths of the unfathomable water wherein, as momentary lights glance into it, I have had glimpses of buried treasure and other things submerged. It was appointed that the book should shut for a spring, forever and forever. When I had read but a page, it was appointed that the water should be locked in eternal frost when the light was playing on its surface, and I stood in ignorance on the shore. My friend is dead, my neighbor is dead, my love, the darling of my soul, is dead. It is the inexplorable consolidation and perpetuation of the secret that was always in that individuality and which I shall carry in mind to my life's end. And any of the more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are, well, in any of the burial places of this city through which I pass, is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their innermost personality to me or than I am to them? That's pretty deep. It's talking about like everybody's equal and everybody lives and dies. As to this, his natural and not to be alienated inheritance, the messenger on horseback had exactly the same possessions as the king, the first minister of state, or the richest merchant in London. So with the three passengers shut up in the narrow compass of one lumbering old mail coach, they were mysteries to one another. As complete as if each had been in his own coach in six, or his own coach in sixty, were the breadth of a country between him and the next. The messenger rode back at an easy trot, stopping pretty often at alehouses by the way to drink, but evincing a tendency to keep his own counsel and to keep his hat cocked over his eyes. He had eyes that assorted very well with that decoration, being of a surface black, with no depth in color or form, and much too near together, as if they were afraid of being found out in something, singly, if they kept too far apart. They had a sinister expression under an old cocked hat like a three-corner spittoon and over a great muffler for the chin and throat which descended nearly to the wearer's knees. When he stopped for a drink, he moved this muffler with his left hand, only while he poured his liquor with his right. As soon as that was done, he muffled again. No, Jerry, no, said the messenger, harping on one theme as he rose. It wouldn't do for you, Jerry. Jerry, you honest tradesman. It wouldn't suit your line of business, we called. Bust me if I don't think I've he'd been drinking. His message perplexed his mind to the decree, to the degree that he was feigned several times to take off his hat to scratch his head, except on his crown, which was raggedly bald. He had stiff black hair, standing jaggedly all over it, and growing downhill almost to his broad, blunt nose. 
It was like so Smith's work, so much more like the top of a strongly spiked wall than a head of hair, that the best of players at Leapfrog might have declined him as the most dangerous man in the world to not go over. While he tried it back with the message he was to deliver to the night watchman in his box at the door of Telson's Bank by Temple Bar, who was delivered to great authorities within, the shadows of the night took such shapes to him as arose out of the message, and took such shapes as to the mayor as arose out of her private topics of uneasiness. They seemed to be numerous, for she shied at every shadow on the road. What time the mail cloach slumbered, jolted, rattled, and bumped upon its tedious way with its three fellow inscrutables inside, to whom, likewise, the shadows of the night revealed themselves in the forms their dozing eyes and wandering thoughts suggested. Telson's bank had run up into a, up in the mail. As the bank passenger, with an arm drawn through the leather strap, which did what lay it in the keep from pounding against the next passenger and driving him into the corner, wherever the coach got a special jolt knotted in his place with eye, half eyes shut, the little coach windows and the coach lamp dimly gleamed through them, and the bulky bundle of opposite passenger became the bank and did a great stroke of business. The rattle of the harness was the chink of money, and more drafts were honored in five minutes than even Telson's, with all its foreign and home connections. Ever paid in three the time? Then the strong rooms underground at Telson's, with such of their valuable stores and secrets as were known to the passenger, and it was not little that he knew about them, opened before them, and he went in among them with the great keys and the feebly burning candle and found them safe and strong and sound and still, just as he had last seen them. But through the bank was almost always with him, and through the coach, in a confused way, like the presence of pain under an opiate, was always with him. There was another current of impression that never ceased to run, all through the night. He was on his way to dig some out of a grave. Dig someone out of a grave. Now, which of the multitude of faces that showed themselves before him was the true face of the buried person? The shadows of the night did not indicate, but they were all the faces of a man of five and forty by years, and they differed principally in the passions they expressed and in the ghastliness of their worn and wasted state. Pride, contempt, defiance, stubbornness, submission, lamentation succeeded one another. So did verities of sunken cheek. Cadav cadaverous, oh, col cadaverous color, emaciated hands and figures, but the face was in the main one face, and every head was pre prematurely white. A hundred times the dozing passenger inquired of the spectra, buried how long? The answer was always the same, almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out long ago. You know that you were called to life, they tell me so. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Shall I show her to you? Will you come and see her? The answer to the questions question were various and contradictory. Sometimes the broken reply was, Wait, it would kill me if I saw her too soon. Sometimes it was given in a tender rain of tears, and then it was, Take me to her. Sometimes it was staring and bewildered, and then it was, I don't know her. I don't understand. After such imaginary discourse, the passenger and his fancy would dig and dig, dig now with a spade, now with a great key, now with his hands, to dig the wretched creature out. Got out at last, with earth hanging about his face and hair, he would suddenly fall away to dust. The passenger would then start to himself and lower the window to get the reality of mitts and rain on his cheek. Yet even when his eyes were open on the midst and rain, on the moving patch of light from the lamps and the hedge of the roadside retreating by jerks, the night shadows outside the coach would fall into the train of the night shadows within. The real banking house by Temple Bar, the real business of the past day, the real strong rooms, the real express sent after him, and the real message returned would all be there. Out of the midst of them, the ghostly face would rise and he would again accost it. Buried how long? Almost 18 years. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Dig, 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 until an impatient movement from one of the two passengers would admonish him to pull up the window, draw his arm securely through the leathern strap, and speculate upon the two slumbering forms until his mind lost its hold of them, and they again slid away into the bank and the grave. Buried how long? Almost 18 years. 
You had abandoned all hope of being dug out long ago. The words were still in his hearing as just spoken, distinctly in his hearing as ever spoken words had been in his life. When the weary passenger started to the consciousness of daylight and found that the shadows of the night were gone, he lowered the window and looked out at the rising sun. There was a ridge of plowed land with a plow upon it which had been left last night when the horses were unyoked beyond a quiet coppice wood and which many leaves of burning red and golden yellow still remain upon the trees. Though the earth was cold and wet, the sky was clear, and the sun rose bright, placid, and beautiful. Eighteen years, said the passenger, looking at the sun. Gracious creator of the day, to be buried alive for eighteen years. That was uh, chapter three of A Tale of Two Cities. Um, it re reinforces that four, uh, point. Eighteen years, buried alive for eighteen years. I don't know if they're being literal or figurative. So I guess we'll find out. Um, if you enjoyed that reading, then uh, click the thumbs up button. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. I'm uh, reading this uh, during a hurricane, so that should be worth a uh, subscribe and uh, maybe hit the little bell if you like as well. I don't know. I'm not really sure what that even does, but it sounds good. So uh, once again, thanks for listening. Uh, keep reading. This is like probably as complicated as the book we'll see on this channel, uh, but I appreciate all the comments that you've been leaving below as well. And uh, thanks again. Have a nice day.